Hello, Bravs. We're back with The Witch and the Priest by Hilda Lewis, a novel based on the true story of Joan Flower, the infamous 17th century witch. We will pick up with chapter two, if I can find it. Chapter two. He all but crossed himself, then, remembering the king's changing views on the subject of witches, and that a priest must lead his flock against superstition, in secret as well as in public, his arm fell. But all the same, a rutterkin, he challenged with the name of Joan Flowers Familiar. The cat was no longer there. Had it slunk away so quickly that his old eyes had not been good enough to follow it, or had it disappeared by magic? And suddenly he found himself calling Joan Flower's name in the in the de, in the deserted place. And now the question that had tormented him this twelve month burst forth: Did we wrong you bitterly, you and your two daughters, or were you rightly judged? Tell me, tell me, Joan Flower. There was no answer. He called again more urgently. Were you a witch, Joan Flower? Were you a witch? And now he heard a sound like the sighing of a long dead voice, or perhaps it was the sighing of his own heart. You judged me. And suddenly she was there, Joan Flower, as he had seen her last, dark haired, streaked with gray, falling ragged about her face, and that t face twisted to one side in a dreadful grin as she lay dying of the fit that had stricken her down. And now he remembered the first time he had seen her, 30 years ago, and how he had stared to find an exotic a creature, how he had stared to find so exotic a creature in his remote village, a tall young woman with a high bosom and a fine carriage. 16, though she'd looked older when she came limping into Botsford on her blistered feet, come from beyond Derby, and before that from London, brought up in a gentleman's house, she's, she'd said when he questioned her fine speech. Her father, she didn't know, never set eyes on him. A foreign gentleman, her mother said, Italian or Spanish or Scot. Her mother, a servant, a good servant, clever with her needle. So they'd kept the child, spoiled her above a little. She'd been let to play at times with the little lady of the house, an only child and lonely. When she was old enough, the young lady had taken her to be her maid. That was where she'd picked up her fine speech. They'd turned her away at the last, and she not yet 15. Why? Her mother was dead, and the young visiting gentlemen too free with their glances. That was her tale, the Botsford gossip said, resenting from the first that foreigner with her fine looks and her fine ways and her fine speech. John Flower, honest fellow, had seen her and fancied her, married her too, paid for what he might have had for nothing, so the gossip went, a bad woman, a bad wife, a foreigner. Well, as to the truth of all that, he didn't know. Gossip had held its tongue while her husband lived. John Flower had a strong arm and knew how to use it. But certainly she'd looked foreign enough with her great dark eyes and the proud shoulders and the black hair that streamed backwards beneath its scarlet, scarlet riband. Or is it riband? What decent married woman of Botsford would go about capeless, capless and all tied about with scarlet ribbons, ribbands? Let me look this word up so I don't botch it. Well, I have no internet, so. As for John Flower, maybe he had made a bad bargain. A silent, sad man, when the drink was not in him, he'd, say, he'd said nothing. But for all her brave looks, there'd been no sweetness in her face, not even when she'd sent him the rector, one of her sidling, sidelong glances. Yes, she tried that game upon him, too, taking him for one of those lustful persons of which God knew. There were enough and to spare, 
not shepherds, but wolves ready to destroy the lambs entrusted to their care. She'd been all invitation and no kindness. Men should beware of her, he had thought, his own heartbeat a little quickened. For others, he found a sweetness in her. Even in little Botsford, she'd had her fill of lovers. And now again, she was fixing him with those same eyes. But they were mournful eyes, holding all the sorrow of the world. But even as he looked, they were beginning to change. The look he knew was coming back to them, the wanton, the wanton look. And yes, she was growing younger, but for all that, not so very young, a gap where a tooth was missing. So she had looked when she went up to Belvoir more than 10 years ago to ask work for her daughters. How old had she been? 32, 35, her eldest daughter, Margaret, was close on 15. That day, he said, was the beginning of everything. It began before that, she said, and put a finger to her forehead as though this smoothed still further time's marks. It began the day I understood my daughters were growing up and I growing old. But, she said, and there was a sweetness in her now, so that he began to understand a little why men had loved her. You are not so young yourself, priest, and it blows cold. Come within doors. The door gave at her touch, and he followed her in. There was a fire in the deserted cottage. The hearth swept. He had not expected that. The white cat lay stretched along the warm hearth. Now it sprang up and spat. She quieted it in an unknown tongue. It was not uncomfortable in the dark little room. For all its musty smell, it was clean enough, with fresh rushes strewn about the earth floor. Some rogue or beggar, not knowing the tale, he thought, had sheltered for the night. No, she said, such gentry would not leave all clean, let alone make it so. It is the wandering, the wandering spirit returning to its earthly home, she smiled into his startled eyes. The eyes of a ghost see clear through flesh and blood to the thoughts within. She stooped to the hearth, holding her fingers to the blaze. He could see, see clean through them to the glowing wood. The old and the young may see us sometimes. With them, with them the veil between the world and the next is thin. And again he glimpsed the sweetness in her. There was a stool each side of the hearth. She stood one and motioned him to the other. Between them, the white cat stretched and stared at him with spiteful eyes. It is strange, she said, a priest of God and the ghost of a witch. Yet here we sit together like old friends, we that were never friends in the flesh. But why should we not be friends? Her hand went out as though to touch him, but stayed short. Yet for all that his flesh crept with the cold. Though you help to hang me, who shall say you were wrong? But, oh, priest, priest, the cruelty of men. And women, he asked, remembering the bitter evil she had done. What of women? She sighed on the breath of her sighing. He felt again the coldness of her presence and drew a little nearer to the fire. The cruelty of men and the vanity of women. Between these points, priest, the sun spins. The vanity of women, she said again. It brought me to the master, growing old. It was a thing I could not endure. There is nothing to fear in age. Not for you, priest, but for me. It could bring its own beauty. To you, she said gently, but not to me, not to my sort of woman. He sighed, knowing it to be true. And yet, the day she had gone up to the castle, she had looked young enough, younger than most women of her class that toiled in the fields and in the kitchen. Yet, you were comely, he said, and what is a wrinkle here and there? That is a man's question, and his own eyes answer him. As for me, the day I saw those wrinkles, it was the beginning of the end. I had to keep my looks, priest. They were my livelihood, my only livelihood, when John Flower died. And before he died, Samuel Fleming asked, Honest John had a heavy hand, and I walked carefully, though not always righteously, for I was sick of supping always at the one dish, and that dish lacking salt or savor. And then he died, good John, honest John, and left me without a penny piece and my two girls to fend for. So I was glad enough to take to my trade. And why not? I loved men, and they loved me. 
He made a little movement of recoil, and she laughed. We are in, du in duty bound to love all men, she said, and there was a look of mischief, mischief about her. He could easily believe her to be of the devil. I love men, but not women, nor did any women, woman love me. They could not forgive me my face, such as it was. That was true. It was her looks that had started all the trouble. Women would come to him with their tales, and every tale ending with complaints about her looks. A man's woman, and foreign with it. Her good looks a gift from the devil. How else did she keep them? A woman's a hag at 35, but she certainly, her look of youth came from the devil. And yet she said, I did love women too. Once I'd nurse them. I was good at simples. It was a knowledge I had of my mother, but I'd get no thanks. They would drink my possets and all the time they'd watch me out of the corners of their eyes. Or while I'd sweep the room, the good wife in her bed would stare as though any minute I'd fly away on her broomstick. Oh, yes, they'd enjoy the fruits of my labor and call me with for my pains. Call me witch for my pains. But I was no witch then, no more than you, yourself. I'd never so much as thought of a pact with the master. Why should I? I had all I wanted. Men and food and wine and new, a new kerchief or buckles for my shoes. Not much, perhaps, by a lady's reckoning, but enough. And then one day, quite suddenly, I understood these good things must come to an end, and the time not far distant. Her rueful smile showed the gap where she had lost the tooth. Soon no man would want me. That was the day I took the devil for my master. A hot summer day it was, and I in this very room. There was a hollyhock tapping against the window, and a thrush singing, be quick, be quick, or maybe it was my own heart singing because I was waiting for my lover. No, priest, never look at me like that. I've had men, but when I say I love them, I meant in the way of trade, and I've never had but one love. Pete, he said, remembering the scandal. Pete's wife had stirred up the trouble, poor, stupid, and Pete, pitting herself against this quick, bright creature. Yet, as in the old fable, the quick, bright thing had lost, the slow, stupid creature had won. She nodded. He was my true love. At least I was true. A woman needs the comfort of a man's body, and Flower had been dead about five years. Five year. Been dead above five year. And what was he at the best of times? A clod, scarce warmer living than dead. Often I'd thought of helping him where he belonged, clod among clods, but I never had harmed him. I've harmed this text by botching it. To wish him dead was that no harm. I think he knew. I think he was glad not to get well again. She shrugged. Do you think it was wicked of me to take Pete, to take all the men who'd come, and there were plenty, I'll own, but what harm? I'd give them happiness, adventure, excitement, all the things their wives couldn't give. And what did you take from their wives, he asked, grave? Nothing. Or their men wouldn't have come to me, those women. They had their homes. They had their men and the work of their hands. They had a safety I hadn't got. A safety I, had, I hadn't got. She laughed a little. At least he could not be sure whether she laughed or cried. There was a wailing note to the sound. Well, and she was brisk again. There I was waiting for Pete. And then I heard his feet come along the path. The steps went round the house. And then I heard a voice, a woman's voice, Margaret's voice, a child I'd thought her. I should have known better. No woman's a child at 15. Her voice was high as a fiddle string. A woman's voice when the flesh is stirred. No, she cried out. No, but it was clear that she meant yes. Pete laughed. I knew that laugh. Tender enough to melt the marrow in your bones. I was listening all soft and silly with love. I don't know how long it was before I understood that he was playing me false with another woman and that woman, my daughter. Perhaps it was a minute, perhaps an hour. The bitter heart has no truck with time. 
I started up then. I went to the door, but I didn't open it. No need to look through any door to know where those two were going. No need to guess, neither, what they were going to do together in the darkness of the wood. I came back to my place and sat there among the ashes, and I held my head in my two hands, and my heart was broken, and I never once thought of Margaret, not as Margaret, my daughter, my child, to be protected. I thought only of the woman who'd taken my lover. I'd lost my lover to a younger woman. I sat there rocking myself backwards and forwards, trying to think my way out of it, but nothing would come into my head, save that I was growing old and she was young. And she must go away, but where and how? I hadn't any money and I hadn't any friends, but go she must, she must go. And then there was Philippa, Philip we called her, if I'd thought of her as a child who could blame me, going on for going on for 13 and thin as a rat. If I hadn't been so taken up with Pete, I'd have known before this, it was Philip would be the danger. Quick, where Meg was slow, dark and a high color where Meg was pale, warm where Meg was cold. Meg took, Meg took after her father, a true bred flower. They used to joke about it, a real flower, they'd say, remember? And it was true, in a way, she was a pretty thing if you like them pale and slow, but her face, to my mind, was a little stupid. But Philip, the devil knows who fathered her, not Flower. Her eyes were narrow and dark, slanting a little with a squint to them. She could do more with that squint than another woman with eyes like stars. There was a man going with her then. It was Tom Simpson, took her maidenhead, 12 years and no virgin. And I didn't know, didn't even think about it. That day it was Meg troubled me. And sitting there all hopeless, I thought, let her stay, let her go. It's all one. Lose your looks, lose your man. Old, I was growing old. An old woman, what would there be for me in the long days to come? The longer nights. I remember sitting there and fighting myself not to look at my face. In the fine mirror, Pete had brought me from Lincoln Fair. I did not dare to look, but all the time my fingers kept straying, a wrinkle or two, not many, but enough, enough. My hand went creeping alongside my mouth, and then, it's strange, I haven't a body any longer, and I know the vanity of vanity, but still it's hard to tell you what I found. She paused. He could see she was driving herself to speak. In the corner of my mouth, the left corner, a hair, so soft, so small, my finger couldn't be sure. I tried it with my tongue. My tongue could feel it. My tongue was sure. A hair, so soft, so small, innocent, but it wouldn't stop that way. I would pull it out, but it would grow again, and more of them, more. I forgot about Margaret. I forgot about Pete. I forgot everything but that little soft hair. It was stupid of me. One hair, one little hair, but I remembered women I'd seen, old women, beards, and with the children would call, and which the children would call after them, which. I'd been handsome enough, still was, but I'd lose my first tooth, seen my first wrinkle, and now my first hair. Soon the children would be calling after me, after me too. I went on sitting there, the, there, Jesus. I went on sitting there. The room got dark and then more dark. Margaret hadn't come in yet, and I didn't know where Philip was. Up to the same tricks as her sister, if I'd only known. I was glad they were both away. I didn't want to see either of them, and especially I didn't want to see Meg. It got very dark in the room, and still I went on sitting there with my poor face hidden in my hands, as though I wanted to shield it from it even from the dark. And then suddenly I was shivering, bitterly cold for all it was midsummer. A man was in the room with me. I knew it without looking up. He must have slipped in quiet and forgotten to latch the door. I looked up to scold him for his carelessness, but the words froze on my lips. I could just see him, a shadow in the red of the fire. He was all in black and his head higher than this ceiling. He was forced to carry it bent a little to one side, and I knew it wasn't a man at all, not a human man. I knew it by the terrible cold that came from him. I knew it by the fear in my heart. 
he began to speak, a deep voice he had. He said he knew my troubles, and if I chose, there'd be no more sorrow for me ever. I'd live like a queen, doing as I pleased, and no man nor woman to say me nay. I wouldn't listen at first. Live like a queen, I shouldn't know how. I'd been poor all my life, and I got along pretty well. I'd done much as I pleased, and if there was little in my pocket, there was always a hair for my pot or a piece of fat bacon. I had my men. He told me there was nothing in the world I couldn't have. I'd never grow old, he said, and that's how he caught me. By a hair, a little, little hair. And so for the sake of keeping my looks and taking my pleasure, I sold my soul. Samuel Fleming's voice came out on a sigh. So you did sell your soul. She nodded, but you know that very well. You judged me, priest, but I did not sell it then, not that first time. For though he promised everything heart could desire, the payment was heavy. I should have to vow to serve him alone for swearing God and his son by baptism and all part in him. And this pact I must seal with my blood, the pact there, there's no undoing. For priests, what they say is true. When you seal that pact with your blood, the place will never heal. See, she held out her arm and showed him the angry place, scarring its smoothness. When the master puts his mark upon you, you carry it to your death, and to your death indeed. How many of his servants has the mark not brought to the grave, and how many innocents too? For between the master's mark and the marks of nature, it is not always easy to tell. Such is his cunning. And so they swing alike, the witch and the innocent. Not alike, Samuel Fleming shook his head. The innocent fly straight to the bosom of God. And does that comfort them as they dangle, the breath choking in their lungs, and the eyeballs starting from their head? If your God is all-powerful, priest, and if he hates wickedness, why then does he allow it? It seems to me a very great nonsense. God wills us to choose. God has no delight in the, in the bird that is snared, but in the bird that is free. He wills us to be free that we may choose. How are poor souls to judge, all ignorant as we are? But I stray from my tale. The master said he would send a spirit to serve me, though I had signed no pact. It should serve me for a little while, that I might see how well he cared for those upon whom he had set his love, even though they had not as yet set their love upon him. We stood there facing each other, and I saw the man that was no man begin to melt upon the darkness. You could see the firelight through him before he vanished altogether. A little warmth began to creep back into the room, and while I knelt by the hearth to warm my starved fingers, a cat jumped upon my shoulder. A white cat, it put down its head, weaving from side to side. Suddenly it leaped, and there was a sharp pain beneath my breast. Darkness came up at me. And into the darkness I went down. When I came to myself, the fire was out and the room bitter cold. My first thought was that I'd been dreaming. I rubbed my eyes and looked about me. There on the hearth, a white cat glared at me with red eyes. There was blood about its mouth. There was blood above my heart. Samuel Fleming bowed his head in sorrow, though it was an old tale, finished and done with. How could he help but grieve? He that had helped her to her death, and his grief was the greater that he had failed to bring her to loving, to the loving kindness of God. Priest, she said, it grows chill, and you are old. You should be gone from this place, but come again. It is not given to every man to see in a, into a woman's heart, and that a woman, and that woman, a witch. He said, very grave, I shall not come here again. Should you not try to understand why it all happened and how it happened to the end, the end in which you played your part? I shall not come here, he said again. It is forbidden to consort with spirits, but spirits are not forbidden to consort with men. 
Not is it forbidden to men to dream, nor is it forbidden to men to dream. And indeed, they cannot escape their dreams. There was something sly about her. Why do you haunt me? He asked sharply. Because you call me back, you with your unceasing thought of me and your everlasting questions, questioning. Since I died, then I am my master. The gates are, the gates of hell are shut against me. Since I died unshriven, the gates of heaven are shut against me also. I come because you will not let me rest. While I was yet alive, you did not with a full heart wrestle for my soul. But because you grieve for my sake, a more chance is given you to win my soul for your God. If you fail, your soul is in peril also. Because you failed to do that which your God set you to do. But it is all in vain. The toil and the anguish, I am not to be one. And you, not afraid, priest. Are you not afraid, priest? Yes, I am an old man, and I am afraid. I will not meddle with ghosts. He crossed himself. He shivered violently and put his hands to his eyes. It was twilight. And the cop, and I fall asleep. So am I. There was a light wind blowing rustling the leaves and rustling the grass, and in the rustle he thought a voice whispered, men cannot escape their dreams. He rose stiff and with his old man's walk moved slowly towards home, and he did not notice that the white cat followed him all the way. Tedious, probs, tedious. And that's all for chapter two. Chapter three, next time, bruv. Goodbye. Goodbye.